Good morning, COTC. Uh, I'm Kurt Williams, and today we're talking about uh, spiritual rut. Uh, you know, when they reached out to me, God works in funny ways. They reached out to me and asked me about talking about a time in the past that I've been in a spiritual rut uh, and, that, and, and things that I've done to get out of it. Uh, I realized, you know, after they asked me that, that, that I was in a little bit of a spiritual rut at that time. Uh, we were just coming out of the holidays, and uh, we hadn't met, our life group hadn't met for a few weeks. Uh, people were out of town or we had a few people that were sick. I love you guys. So anyway, I was out of routine, and while I was out of that routine, I, I started uh, disconnecting from God a little bit. I, I lost some of my intentional habits of prayer uh, and getting into God's Word. Uh, so I think that's the first thing, is just sort of recognizing that something might be off um, and, and finding your way to, to get intentional and get back into that. So uh, the other thing is reaching out to, to other believers. I can always talk to my wife. Uh, she's always there to listen and to lift me up and then uh, through my life group I can always reach out to those guys and when we meet on our weekly basis uh, it's a time where we share each other's burdens uh, we lift each other up uh, and, and there's lots of laughter uh, and connecting there uh, you know I was on my way to work this morning and I pulled up onto highway 44 and somebody had just uh, ran into the driver's side door of another car and thank God they pulled off to the side and everybody was okay but it was just a reminder that that life is short and it's fragile, uh, and that we need to spend every day uh, connecting with God and, and loving others. With God's help, uh, that's what I intend to do, even if I get in the occasional spiritual rut. Good morning. I'm going to finish up our series entitled Unstuck today, and we've been talking for the last few weeks about different areas of our lives where um, we either have been stuck, we are stuck now, or if, if we have, eventually we all will, will, will get stuck in one of these areas, um, like not gaining any traction, like we want to, we want to move forward in this area of our life, but we can't gain any traction, we have no momentum, we're feeling frustrated, possibly defeated, and, and that's what happens when you're stuck for a long time, right? You, you get frustrated, and then the longer you're stuck, you sort of get to a place where you're ready to just give up. You're defeated and ready to give up. So we're, we're trying to talk you out of giving up and into some things that might help you get unstuck. The first week we talked about being stuck in our busyness. If you feel busy, your, your pace, the pace of your life is frantic and you feel stressed out all the time and, and worried all the time. And um, Check out that sermon series on our YouTube channel or our website, um, Getting Unstuck from Your Business. And then last week we talked about getting, getting unstuck from our debt. We talked about our finances. And then today um, we're going we're gonna to talk about getting unstuck spiritually because that happens to people. Like spiritually um, we find ourselves in a rut, not moving forward, not gaining any traction. And, and the obvious way people get stuck is Rather than fight sin in their life, they invite sin in their life. Like they keep, at, they keep God at a distance, like, God, I know you say this, but I'm going to do my own thing and I'm not going to listen to you. And obviously that's how, if, if you want a formula for getting spiritually um, stuck, run from God and live life your own way. But I don't want to talk about being stuck in that way. I want to talk about... Um, a, a different sort of spiritual rut, uh, maybe talking to a different set of people in here, because there are many of us who do want a relationship with God, like we're trying, and we once felt deeply connected to God, we once felt on fire, but here lately it seems like we're not, we're not feeling it, we're not moving anywhere with God, the fire has kind of um, fizzled, we're sort of going through the motions, we're having difficulty finding joy and peace, maybe we're bored and distracted um, when it comes to our spiritual life, it's hard to get up maybe and get, for, for those who are in a spiritual rut, it's hard to get up on Sunday mornings and go to church. Um, for those who are in a spiritual rut, reading the Bible just doesn't inspire you or fill you back up anymore. Like, like for those of you who are in a spiritual rut, you may like feel no sense of spiritual direction or no passion, no passion at all. And, and for you, it's not, you don't want to be, but you are stuck. And so that's what I want to talk about today, because for those of you who can relate to this, for those of you who maybe are spiritually stuck right now, um, I want you to know that you're not alone in it. Like, this happens to everyone who is pursuing Jesus, including a guy in the Bible named David. And David writes about it. He doesn't just, David doesn't just journal about it, like write down his feelings. 
David writes a letter to God in the middle of his spiritual rut, in the middle of being stuck. And this is what he says. This is his lament in Psalm 13, uh, verses 1 and 2. It begins, how long, Lord? How long is this going to take? How much longer? I'm getting tired of this. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Are you catching the emotion behind the questions? Like, like, like how's David feeling here? Why, why is he writing this? He's writing this because he's feeling dis- disconnected from God. Like he's feeling forgotten. And he's feeling frustrated. Like he's in a rut. And so in the middle of his rut, in the middle of feeling stuck, in the middle of feeling forgotten, what he does is he takes it to the Lord. And, and I read those words that David wrote, and I, as I'm reading them, I'm going, I've said those things, not in those exact words, but I've said similar things in my prayers, like, like in my own words, my prayers when I'm stuck or when I'm feeling spiritually disconnected or frustrated, like, like my prayers sound literally like, what is going on, God? Like, this is not working out the way I wanted it to. Like, don't hide from me. Um, I need to know, come on. Like, come on. Like, I need you right now. Come through for me. Like, like, and this is David. Like, this is David in anguish. Like, how long? Don't hide. Feels like you've left me. And David, in the middle of his rut, is pursuing God, but he's not feeling like he's finding God. So David's in a rut spiritually. This is good for us to read because... And good for us to hear because when, when you're stuck, one, you need to know you're not alone. One, you need to know it's, it's kind of normal to, to get stuck at times. And because of that, in the middle of your stuckness, don't panic. Like, don't freak out. Um, calm down. Just because it doesn't feel like God is with you does not mean that he's, does not, mean that he's not there or not listening. So instead... In the middle of your rut, calm down, don't panic. And I want to give you a few suggestions. These are just biblical su- suggestions for what you might do to help yourself get unstuck. And the first suggestion is this. If you're feeling stuck or when you get stuck spiritually, if you're not feeling connected to God, one, call it what it is. Like say it out loud. Like admit, I'm stuck. I feel disconnected. I feel far from God for some reason. And you need to tell that to God. It's okay to tell him that. It's okay to lament. It's okay to even angrily come at God with your frustration because God's a big guy. God's a big boy. God can take it. He actually wants you to do that. But also, um, don't just tell God I'm stuck. Tell God how you feel. David in a different psalm writes this, Psalm 27. He says, Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face, your face I will seek. So, so David's saying, I'm after you, God. I'm, I'm chasing after you. I'm pursuing you. I want you in my life. But, but it feels like, like don't hide your face from me. Don't turn your servant, servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my Savior. So David's saying here, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. And he's sharing with God, I'm not okay here. There's something wrong. This life is hard enough without you. I need you. So call it what it is. I'm stuck. Like something is wrong. Admit there's something wrong. Uh, I'm feeling disconnected. And here's why it's important that you do this. Here's why it's important that you do this. Um, Pretending that nothing is wrong is dangerous. Pretending nothing's wrong is dangerous. And listen, when something is wrong with you, silence is deadly. Like keeping quiet when there's something wrong will have deadly consequences in in every situation and in every relationship. Like like wouldn't you say it's true if this happens a lot in marriage. There's something wrong, you talked about it, you argued about it, you can't resolve it, so you keep arguing about it, and then at some point something is still wrong, but then you go quiet. And then you stop addressing it. And the silence, then, is the beginning of the end. Happens a lot in marriage. Anyone ever watch The Office? I'm not saying you should, but anybody ever watch The Office? (laughs) So in The Office, there's this couple, right? Um, There was this couple named Jim and Pam. 
Jim and Pam were this couple you were rooting for. They had this, like, uh, from a distance, they liked each other, but it just wasn't going to happen. And later on, the, later on in the show, uh, in, the, in the series, they finally, they finally make it. They finally come together. They get, they get married, and then they have a child, and Jim gets promoted. He gets moved. He gets transferred. And so Jim is working in Philly um, during the week and coming back to Scranton on the weekends and... And there's a disconnect because of that, because of the distance, because he's not around. And when he comes home, there's, there's just tension, right? And so on this particular, in this particular episode, it's Valentine's Day, and Jim surprises Pam. He comes home on Valentine's Day. He comes home a little early. And even when he's there on Valentine's Day, there, there's tension. And Pam, Pam asks Jim, um, are, and she notices, and she says, are you okay? And Jim says, I'm fine. She says, you're not fine. What's going on? And Jim says, I'm fine, and they begin to they begin to um, they begin to argue, and they they kind of get um, uh, they're on each other, you know, and, and they're fighting. And Jim finally kind of nobly says, um, "I'm going to go, you know what? I'm just I'm going to go back home. I'm going to go back to Philly. I'm going to go back to work." And and he walks away, and there's silence. And he gets to the door, and there's silence. Things are quiet and tense, and as he opens the door and gets ready to walk out, Pam finally speaks up and says, um, I don't think you should go. I think we should fight. And, and Jim says, you mean you want to fight on Valentine's Day? And Pam says, yep. And it was just like in that episode, in that moment, you realize things were going to be okay because Pam decided not to, to be quiet, not to go quiet. And so for us, when, like when we stop fighting and we stop sharing and we stop dealing with our issues and problems, silence is deadly. Same with God. Like So when we're stuck, and, and so, some, of you, some of you know mine and Val's story when we started this church. Um, our story uh, the last three years has been incredible um, blessing and excitement and we love this place and this church and you like no other church we've ever been a part of but at the same time the last two or three years is full of heartache pain and loss and back in September uh, just kind of compounding heartache pain and loss right and back in September uh, I crushed my finger chasing uh, a puppy at my house, which is a, a ridiculous way to crush your finger, and it required surgery. It's just a finger got nine more. It's not a big deal, but but the timing of it, it was a big deal. Surgery, I'm out for a little bit. I'm down for a little bit, um, and so there was this there was this moment in in October, November, where I was just like 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 I had it, and. I woke up a couple different times in October, October, December time frame, and so I wake up and, and I get myself ready and then ready to have my quiet time before I leave for the office and my wife's already gone to work. And for some reason, I, I just felt like in my quiet time, I, uh, I needed to go downstairs to do what I was, I needed to go to the basement to do what I was gonna do. I don't know why, like, like the dogs were gonna hear something they shouldn't hear, you know, because I had some words to say. Uh, but, but the basement just felt like the right place to go yell. And I go to the basement, and, and I let God have it a couple different times over the course of a month. And, and my prayer was, and it was, it, was, it was loud, and it was angry, and it was, God, I'm not doing well. Like, I hate what's happening. I, I, I'm not fine. This is not working out the way, the way I planned. I'm doing what you've asked me to do, and at the same time, all of this pain and all of this hurt, like it feels lonely and it feels like you're not here and it feels like you're not helping. Where are you at? Where are you at? Like this, this, was, this was my prayer. Just kind of shaking my fist at the Lord. And that's okay to do. God's okay with that. God wants his children to come to him with how they feel and with their hurts and with their pain, even if I'm coming to him, to him angry. It would be worse if I came, if I didn't show up, right, and was silent. So in your pain, call it what it is and take it to the Lord. The second thing you could do, these are just suggestions. There's no order here. There's no pattern here. There's no formula here. But if you're stuck, it may be that you need to call it what it is, or it may be that you need to actually make an effort. You need to do something about it. 
I remember one time when I was in high school and I, I grew up redneck with a bunch of rednecks. Um, that's why I felt at home in Bullock County. In Bullock County. And so, but we, we were uh, guys, four-wheel drive trucks, big tires, and we would go out to the strip pits and we would, we would go mudding. And on a particular trip, I remember getting stuck and I remember trying to get out, pulling forward, backwards, spinning, overspinning, sinking deeper in the mud. And we were stuck, right? What do you do when you're stuck? You sit there and hope, just hope you get unstuck. No, you get out of the truck and you find anything you can to put in the rut, right? Sticks, old pieces of lumber, rocks, um, whatever, what, whatever you think a tire might grab a hold of and gain traction on, right? You don't just sit there when you're stuck. You do something to help yourself gain traction. A.W. Tozer wrote this. He says, um, every man is as close to God as he wants to be. You are as close to God as you want to be. And so sometimes, sometimes we, we get stuck and we say, um, I'm disconnected from God. I really want to be reconnected with God. Some, sometimes we say we want something, but our actions don't prove that we want it, right? Like, like I say, I want six-pack abs, but evidently not as much as I want Derby City pizza, right? <laughs> right? I mean, I really want, I really want, like we say, I really want all of the time, but the reality is your efforts prove whether or not you really want it. So you say, I really want to feel connected to God. Okay, then when was the last time you practiced a spiritual discipline? Like, when was the last time you read the Bible? When was the last time you fasted? And fasting is when you give something up in your life for a little bit in order to make more room for God. Fasting might be food. When was the last time you gave up a meal in order to pray during that meal, right? When was the last time you completely shut your phone off for an hour to really focus on praying and connecting with the Lord, right? You have to do something. Maybe it's this. Here's one. When was the last time you really investigated like the habits of prayer that might, that might work best for you? Like you sitting at home on the couch on the side of your bed maybe doesn't work for you. Maybe you should go on a prayer walk. Maybe you need to get in, into the woods and just sit and be with God. Maybe you need to get a journal and write your thoughts and write your prayers. Maybe you need to get a prayer partner that you meet with once a week who holds you accountable to pray and who is praying for you as you try to get out of the spiritual rut, right? Like, are you really trying to connect with God or are you just hoping it'll happen? It might be that you need to do your part and lean more into God. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So the, like, when it comes to this, the question is, are you, are you really, you want to connect with God, are you really listening and trying to hear the voice of God? Are you putting yourself in a position where you can hear his voice? We have to do our part. We have to do something. So if you're not feeling anything spiritual, it might be because you're not doing anything spiritual. I wish I'd have put that on the screen. If you're not feeling anything spiritual, it might be because you're not doing anything spiritual. Here's another suggestion. When you're in a rut, focus on the facts and not your feelings. So if you're stuck spiritually, it may be that you're not, you're not feeling it because you're not, because you're not feeling it. Here's what I mean by that. You, faith or faith, if your faith is solely based on your feelings and how you feel in the moment, then that's really not faith. And that's actually a dangerous place to be because feelings change in an instant. Feelings are fickle and untrustworthy. Like, like feelings can change in an instant. It's important for you to be aware of your feelings but at the same time, it's important that you do not make decisions based on your feelings or follow your feelings all the time because feelings can 
mislead you. Let me show you how. I want to try to, I want to, try to give you a real practical example of, of how our feelings could mislead us. And I, I need a volunteer. I know this is weird. This is church. Um, but I need a volunteer. And I promise I will not embarrass you on purpose. Well, just uh, anybody. I need, I need a volunteer. Oh, come on, Mike. Come on up here. Give Mike a hand. This is Mike. Let me set this out here. All right, Mike. You have a seat right here. And I'm going to blindfold you, okay? You want to take your glasses off and hold them? Okay? If you're a really honest man, um, I wouldn't need to blindfold you, so I'm going to blindfold you. All right? I'm just kidding. Just kidding, all right? There you go. But it would help me if you helped me out by closing your eyes. So here's what's going to happen, Mike. I'm going to spin you around, and um, so you're going to have to lift your feet off the ground here in just a second, and I'm going to walk around you while I spin you around, and then I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions, okay? And here we go. Good times. wee -hee! That's better than King's Island, man. Better than King's Island. All right, Mike. When you came in today, when you came in this room, there's only one door that everybody comes in. Which direction is that door? Over there. Okay. Which direction is the front of the stage? Okay. All right. Good. All right. We're going to do that one more time. All right. Let me spin you around. Let me get you disoriented and really messed up now. Because you were real close on those last ones. All right. Which way is the front of the stage, Mike? <laughs> All right. Which direction is the door, the front door, the door that everybody comes in? All right. All right. Let me, un let me take the blindfold off. You got none of them wrong, or none of them right, man. None of them right, none of them right. Give Mike a hand. Thanks, Mike. Good sport, man, good sport. So why did we do that? Um, we take away one of, one of Mike's senses. You take away one of his senses, and then he has to guess, or he has to, he has to feel, right? Um, he had to make his decisions based on his, based on his feelings. And the point of it is, thank you again, Mike, is we can't always trust our feelings. Our feelings will mislead us or misdirect us. Just because I feel that way doesn't make it true. So because of that, I don't make decisions just based on my feelings. I make decisions based on the facts or based on truth, okay? So when I'm in a spiritual rut and I want to connect with God, um, I base my decisions in the middle of that rut based on the truth of who God is, what God has done, and what, God has, and what God's accomplished, right? So the truth about God is he's almighty, and another truth about God is he's ever-present. He's everywhere all the time. So even when I don't feel like he is close to me, he is. Like I base my decisions on the facts of who God is. Even though I don't feel him, I know he's near and I trust that, and I lean on that. When, when it comes to David, the guy who wrote the Psalms, right? Um, the facts about God were established early on in his life. And at the end of the sermon, I'm going to read how he finishes out the Psalms, right? God, how long? Don't leave me. Don't forsake me. Uh, don't forget me. He writes very differently at the end of that psalm. And the reason he writes differently in a more confident way is because of what happened early on in his life that showed truly who God is, right? David, um, early on in his life, he's a shepherd boy. Let's say he's, he's a freshman in high school. His brothers are at war. They are in the army of Israel, and they are fighting the Philistines. The Philistines are made up of, of a bunch of giants, guys six, seven, um, eight, seven, eight feet tall, eight, nine feet tall even. 
When David arrives to bring food to his brothers who are, who are at war or in battle, they are actually hiding in the trenches from the Philistines because the biggest, baddest of all the Philistines steps out and says, we're going to end this battle right here. Give me your best warrior. And he's standing out on the battlefield, and nobody will go fight Goliath, right? And Goliath is one of these dudes that, whatever, eight, nine feet tall would have dominated the NBA and the NFL today. So here's David, freshman in high school. Here's a guy who would have dominated the NBA, NFL. And he asked his brothers what's going on, and they said they're scared, they're afraid. And David steps up in the middle of all this, and he says to the army, to King Saul, he says in 1 Samuel 17, he says, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. And David, freshman in high school, goes out on the battlefield without armor and defeats, this, this, defeats Goliath when nobody else would even try. And later in his life, there's, this, there's another story. As he grows up and he's about to become king, he's running for his life. Um, king Saul hates David because he knows David's going to be the next king and he's a, feeling like he's a threat. And so he has men chasing after him, assassins, groups of assassins. David's hiding in a cave for his life. He's, he's running for his life. And in the middle of running for his life, running scared, Psalm 27, 13 and 14, David writes this. He says, I remain confident. I remain confident of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. And David says, I, I, in the middle of my mess, in the middle of my rut, in the middle of where I'm feeling stuck, in the middle of where's God at in this, I don't know. I don't feel him, but I will wait on him and trust that he's here. Like, so I might feel stuck in the moment or in a season. But at the same time, I know that God is never stuck. And so I may feel far from God, but he's never far from me. Like, God is faithful. That's a fact. So I'm going to hang on. Because of that, I'm going to hang on to him and trust him rather than in the middle of being stuck, in the middle of feeling alone, in the middle of being discontent. Um, I don't go out and do something stupid or unwise or something that's going to cause more pain. I trust in him. I look to him. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. I say this, I read this to you too, because in the middle of you being stuck, trying to keep you from making unwise decisions when you feel disconnected from God, um, if you don't sense it or feel evidence of it, that's okay. But in that time, don't start looking at the other Christians in the room or the other Christians in your life and go, well, they're not stuck. Look how good they've got it. Look how put together they are. They must really be connected. I want what they have. Don't compare. Don't look to other people because appearances can be deceiving. We can look good but still be a mess. And the reality is none of us have it together. None of us have it together as hard as we try to appear to. So don't compare. Don't look to others. Just look to the Lord. Call on the Lord. Here's another suggestion. Do an energy inventory. Do an energy inventory. What's your energy? What's your time? What are your resources been going to? Like, if you're stuck, you need to ask yourself, have I been giving God the attention that this relationship with him needs and deserves? Have I been giving all of my energy to things other than God? Maybe I'm stuck because of that. Maybe I'm stuck because I've been pouring out all of my energy toward work. Or maybe I'm stuck because I've been pouring out all of my energy into this new and exciting relationship. Or maybe I'm stuck because I've just been pouring out all of my energy into, into myself. Like, we do that sometimes. Like, have you, have, you ever, have you ever gone through a season where something other than God is getting your focus and, and energy? If that's the case, you will, you will feel distant from God because you've distanced yourself from him. Like being connected to God is about relationship. It's a relationship, and relationships require time and investment. Matthew 6, 24 says, no one can serve two masters. You can't have two things be the most important thing in your life. They will compete. One will beat out the other. He says, either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. So 
if you give all of your energy to anything else other than God, you will feel stuck because you are stuck. And you're stuck because you've distanced yourself from God. And then here's the final tip if you're stuck. If spiritually you want to feel connected to God and you just haven't felt it in a while, here's the final tip, and this is one of the, this may be the, the best one I could give you. It's love someone. Like, this is huge. If you find yourself spiritually stuck, then love someone. Serve someone. And this will fire back up your connection with God. Like, next week, uh, you're going to hear from Parkerson in a little bit, talk about next week. Um, but, but next week, we're going to talk about our partnership with the village Reparo in Guatemala. And uh, next week's going to be all about that. At some point soon, we will be taking groups of people with us down there for short-term mission trips. If you can go, it will be worth it. And, and here's why. For the last 12 or 15 years, um, I've, I've been taking, before, this, before we planted this church, I've been taking people on short-term mission trips. Um, and if I've not gone with them, I've been sending, organizing and sending people on short-term mission trips to South Africa, China, Bangladesh, the Navajo Reservation here on US, U.S. soil, Haiti after the earthquake. Um, I've, I've sent dozens and dozens of people on, on short-term mission trips. When those groups return, when those people return from those trips, do you know what we hear come out of their mouths? What, do you know what we don't hear? My life stinks. My car, my, this house is a mess. My problems. My, like You don't hear that. You don't hear them complain about their life. What you do hear is, that was awesome. Like, like you got to go. Like, I can't wait to go back. Next time I go, you're going with me. You need to take your kids. Everybody needs to go. Like, God is doing some amazing things. Like, like you hear passion, and you hear fired up. Like, you hear someone who is deeply connected, connected with God, right? They're excited. And you know what's weird about that excitement is those people who, if, if you go to Guatemala, the, the guys that I took to Haiti, they spent money that they normally would have used to buy themselves new nice things. They took vacation from work that they normally would have taken to go to the beach and relax. So they take their money and they take their time and they go to a third world country and work their butts off for a week that's weird. Why would you do that, right? And for a week, they love and they serve people in an abnormal amount of, for an abnormal amount of time. And they come back humbled and excited and deeply connected to God. And it all started because they chose to serve. It all started because they chose to serve. See, when, when we do this is another one I wish I would put on the screen. When we do what, what God is, right? God is love. And so when we do what God is, when we love others, it connects us deeply to God because God is love. John 13, 35 says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So you might be feeling stuck because it's been a while since you really stepped outside of yourself and have given yourself away and served someone else. And, and listen, as, as a church, we say this all the time, we love people. Like as a church, we work hard at getting out of this building and blessing our city and loving our neighbors and loving our neighbors well. We work hard at that. We're intentional about that. We do it often. We, 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 want, we want to love outside of this building. So we say often that we love people. You cannot, with integrity, say, yeah, we love people, because you wear a t-shirt of a church that says that. The only way you can say we love people is for you to get out there and for you to make an effort and for you to do your part. And if you will, then your love for others, when you serve someone, 
when you serve someone, that becomes a billboard that points other people to Jesus. And then a byproduct of you serving others and pointing people to Jesus is this. You get unstuck in your relationship with God. So if you're stuck, love someone, serve someone, and do it in the most socially adventurous, outrageous, creative way. And coming back to David's psalm, wrapping up, I didn't finish reading it. David is stuck. He's frustrated. How long, O oh Lord? It's been a long time. Let's go. I'm waiting. Where are you at? He finishes writing in this way because, of, because he knows even though he's feeling stuck and disconnected now, he's been there. And God has been faithful. And so he writes at the end of that, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. And what we learn from this and what we learn from David is, is even though you may feel disconnected or be in a spiritual rut, never give up, never stop crying out. God is always up to something even, when, even, even though we may not realize it, even though we may not feel it. And in the end, no matter what you're going through, God will come through in some way. Hold on. Hold out for him. Let's pray.